So, look at that. Isn't it beauty? Isn't this beautiful? I got 40 Mbit download and 40 Mbit upload. Which is huge! <laughs> I never had this good internet in my whole life. And that's why we're gonna do a stream and that's why we're gonna watch this Illuvium main council town hall where they discuss the governance we three and while we watch we're gonna play some Illuvium arena because there is no video with it it's just an audio recording right GM, so GM, let's jump into that GM, GM. Oh, hello 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 okay yeah so yep um just just to give some context for for what this town hall's about we kind of just want to go through uh some of the reasoning behind gov v3 we sort of want to cover um sort of three main areas we want to cover um what the need for gov v3 is uh, essentially what wasn't working in gov v2 um, and i'll be going over that um, we're also going to cover uh why we chose some of the specifics in gov v3 um sort of how it solves the problems in gov v2 and annie's going to be going over that um finally we'll be going over uh the future sort of what what is going to need to happen in the future um under gov v3 so um, I guess I'll I'll kick it off with uh, GovV2, sort of what was working, what wasn't working. So we'll start with sort of what wasn't working. Um, one of the things that was a challenge with GovV2 um, was the three-tier structure and all of the things that go along with that. Communication between councils, uh, communications sort of across tiers of councils, um, and decision-making being uh, fragmented and split between um community specialized and IMC levels. This was something that we had a couple things that we implemented to address, but at the end of the day, it was it was just more complex than it needed to be um, for the value we were getting out of it. Um, an additional thing that was a challenge with GovV2 was uh, the increasing IMC requirements, uh, particularly as it relates to engaging with regulators. If anybody hasn't had an opportunity to, you can check out governance news, but um, we've essentially put together a, a uh, disclosure about our application to VARA. It is worth a read if you're interested in that kind of thing. But in engaging in activities like that, the requirements for the IMC are significantly higher than they were, say, uh, 12 months ago, even um, even six months ago, realistically. Um, really quickly, the VARA, the, the thing that he's been talking about, Binance. I think was listed there is licensed through VARA and also Illuvium wants to be licensed there and that's why we have more requirements for the council coming in with this uh, change. And we need to have we need to have that that increase in requirements uh, reflected in some way because it's it's fairly important and without that um, the DAO wouldn't be able to undertake some of the things that that um, we need to be doing and another yeah, but yeah just to to put a, a, a fine point on uh, the this is not in particular a challenge with gov v2 per se um this is this is i would say a challenge that uh any projects in the sector that are going to be looking at uh pursuing a more proactive approach to to regulation are going to be faced with um i think i think uh Blichter's laid out a, a great uh, overall overview in that document for anyone that uh wants to see why uh, you know why this makes sense for us as a project for those that don't it's okay as well the the general point is we, we have a lot of advantages that come from it um but the challenges uh are as a DAO, uh regulators just they don't have a very good framework in place yet even one as proactive as vara in dealing with a structure like ours and so um, it's not unique to V2, uh, but what we did see is is there opportunities to get in front of some of those uh, those risk points with the changes here in in V3. Yeah, absolutely. One of the one of the other challenges with GovV2 was um, the structure for governance V2. It was an unintended consequence that it kind of excluded uh, some experts from participating in governance. And the reality is that. Uh, many of the people that we might want to use as advisors, uh, they don't have the time to commit to being involved in in day-to-day uh, -day discussions within Discord, um, voting on proposals, engaging with the community, and having that sort of holistic perspective on on governance. And the structure we had in GovV2 demanded that 
uh, essentially everybody be participating on that level. And the net result of that was that um, we kind of excluded experts uh, by accident, I suppose. And that was that was something that wasn't working uh, with GovV2. So those are sort of the the main points of of what what we felt wasn't working with GovV2. Um, some of the things in GovV2 were working and are being retained, and I just want to go over those uh, quickly. So like Annie alluded to, um, the IMC has been uh, performing some of the duties, engaging with regulators, but sort of the problem was that 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 requirement wasn't necessarily made clear in our governance documentation. And it's really pretty important that it is clear because if somebody's not interested in that, um, the IMC would not be appropriate for them to run uh, for a position on. Another thing that was working was um, engaging with labs directly and having additional contact points with labs um, as compared to uh, before GovV2 has been a net positive for the DAO. Uh, be able to hear from various team members um, on different perspectives or different elements of development have uh, resulted in more informed decision making. That's nice to hear, huh? That they had a better connection to the team in GovV2 and they were able to uh, improve workflow among each other and and get a benefit out of out of it from both sides. That's great. And in general, uh, better proposals. Um, community engagement and communication is important um, and continuing to make accessible ways to engage with governance is important. I know some people might have mixed feelings on that, but um, on the whole, I think that went reasonably well uh, this past epoch. Wanted to talk about specialization. So specialization is referring to the different sub councils, um, marketing, strategy, and gaming under GovV2. Um, that specialization is valuable um, and it's appropriate to have people who are uh, really focused in on those elements. But the the thing that maybe wasn't working as well is that we don't necessarily need those specialists to be involved in decision making. Um, they can provide value and they can provide context uh, without needing to be involved in things like gathering sentiment from the community or um, voting on proposals. So specialization was something that we felt was valuable. Um, additionally, five member councils are working well. We kind of evaluated whether we wanted to change council sizes, um, but five member councils are functional. Scheduling can be difficult. We do have people um, across the globe, and if that, if we increased council members from five, that would be, uh, in some cases, extremely challenging to schedule a meeting. And additionally, um, any more people would would reduce the efficiency in, in meetings. Just hearing out seven perspectives takes uh, a fair bit longer than than five. So we felt council size was uh, fairly appropriate. So. But that's that's sort of the background for for where we were at and why we were evaluating uh, some governance changes. And I'll let Annie speak a bit more about about how some of those problems are solved in GovV3. Yeah, thanks, Blichter. Um, good good overview for the audience. I would like to just offer for anyone if if you have questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll uh, we'll absolutely try to address those as we go along with uh, with relevant points. Um, I know. Uh, there's been some really good dialogue in terms of feedback uh, to the proposal when it came out. Obviously, for anyone that's seen it, uh, the, the general sentiment is, is very positive, which uh, we surmised it would be. Uh, I think even even we were a little bit surprised at, at quite how how positive the sentiment is overall, uh, which which is a good sign. That said, in terms of why... That is true. Like, the, the proposal was posted and right away it had 50 upvotes or something. So the community is on site. Uh, on the side of this uh, governance v3 change really nice to see that we're all pulling on the same string v3 specifically um, I, I would say the the intent here is to really hone in on keeping the best parts of v2 uh, and addressing parts where uh, you know, maybe we swung the pendulum a little bit too far uh, from from gov v1 uh, to address some of these key points uh, we, we spoke already about uh, regulatory structure uh, and why that's relevant, um, and also uh, you know, some changes that have been you know, maybe more more longstanding that uh, that have been topics identified that it made sense to put into a, a structure like this. So, the the most important like overarching message that I want everyone to take away today is 
in this structure, um, we do take the approach to more centralize the decision making into the IMC, recognizing that the importance of specialists and specialization, uh, having individuals that are highly knowledgeable uh, as advisors is critically important. And in GovV2, uh, we took the step to create a structure that, that recognized that. The, the key advantage, though, that we see moving to V3 is instead of having those experts uh, be required to be the actual end decision makers for the process, let's, let's try and increase the bar to have uh, even more expert uh, individuals that are serving and truly a kind of advise and consent role. Um, and then have a, a smaller number of individuals that are still, at the end of the day, responsible. Um, I, I'm always reminded in these types of discussions, uh, the, the former uh, regional program manager that, that I worked for, uh, he would always t remind me that uh, the, the role in leadership is to always have one single neck to choke if things go wrong. And this is very apropos uh, in a DAO as well. Having uh, 18 or 25 or 30 different people who are all generally responsible for topics can work great, but it's a lot harder to uh, really direct your feedback to, to anyone in particular if you as a community feel like the process is not working as well as it should be. Um, obviously, you can reach out to any of those uh, those council members, but, but you have a lot more diffusion of the responsibility. That said, uh, in this case, the, the experts uh, still should be supporting to bring their knowledge into the, the IMC, uh, but the IMC at the end of the day are in the lead for final calls on behalf of the DAO. Um, we also uh, feel that, that, as Flickter mentioned, the community council is really critical. Uh, we need to stay close and locked in with the community. Uh, we've mentioned a lot, and, and, and I think uh, you know, I've, I've given my feedback, that the council has a critical role uh, of listening regularly to the community on, on all major issues. Um, I, I always make the comment that I'm, I'm a pretty regular lurker in all of the channels um, that are, they're getting feedback and, and seeing action. Um, I don't often engage as much directly in terms of the public face, uh, but in order to, to make sure that I didn't miss something, having a group like the Community Council, uh, this epoch has been invaluable. And so we had the discussion, I think this is one of the points that has been raised, you know, why is the Community Council even needed? Yeah, in the end, the Community Council is like an extension of the IMC. Uh, and this extension reaches into the community and makes sure that nothing is missed and everything is, is seen. And I think that's really good. Otherwise, the IMC is just going to be overloaded if they have to be able to catch everything that's happening in Discord, especially once we ramp up and there is more people in there. There is a lot of it going on right now, even though um, there is just a few individuals active and maybe a few hundred um, casual users on, on Discord at the moment. We've had dialogue about some of the roles that they're filling, maybe being uh, better served uh, with a governance community manager at some point. That said, having a council who is directly uh, integrating with the community is, is super critical, uh, both from a decentralization standpoint, um, as well as just being an additional check on, on the IMC that we have in place. Um, Another another point that, that we th felt is really important with V3 is this concept of active recruiting. For those that have been following, I think Karen, Karen was very open that uh, he felt this was, a, this was an opportunity that we missed over the last epoch or two where uh, being very proactive uh, as in this case the team, uh, but also as the community and going out and finding these experts to uh, encourage them to get more involved and, and take one of these roles. Uh, in this case, the committee role is going to be much more appealing to a lot of these individuals than a you know fairly heavy time investment of a, a sub council, uh, and so this is a really key change point that I'm very confident will allow us to up the quality of uh, of the the committee members. You know, and that said, look, it, it, I think I, I want to be very careful here um, and, and you know recognize the individuals that have served this epoch uh, across all of the the councils and sub councils. Um, this shouldn't be taken as a knock on them. Uh, instead, it, it should be viewed in the light that it's intended, where with a project of the magnitude of, of Alluvium to legitimately be game-changing for the entire industry, uh, there are many, many individuals that are very on board philosophically, that, that want uh, Web3 Gaming to be highly successful, and that would be willing to work with a project like Alluvium, whereas 
very few, maybe no other projects have that opportunity. Uh, and so we should absolutely take advantage of that. And, and it's not a, at all a negative reflection on anyone in the community or in the councils today that that's the case. In terms of the, the council member numbers and the number of councils, uh, I spoke about why IMC and community makes sense. Um, I'll just echo uh, pretty pretty firmly Blichter's point about the number of five being a very very good value. We we did have a fair amount of discussion about you know does going down to a three or going up to a seven person uh, council for any of these any of these make sense. There's potentially some argument for community to to maybe go up to seven. Um, that said, the actual decision making, voting, discussion process gets very, very complex when you increase beyond five, um, and, and to say nothing of the actual uh, just coordination that's necessary. And viewing the community and the IMC as decision-making bodies first, uh, rather than uh, your team members, uh, in, in this case really helped us to land at, at this proposal to, to start with five. And of course, like anything, uh, this is not intended to be set in stone. Uh, we may reevaluate over the course of the next epoch, uh, you know, assuming we go forward here as a community, but but five really is a good number. And in my experience, um, any given topic, you're going to have one or two people that may not be so knowledgeable or have such a strong opinion. If you only have three people, it's very difficult if that happens. Uh, it's really one or two people just talking with themselves. Um, if you have seven or, or you know even nine people, for instance, in a council, it's really impossible for everyone to even get to weigh in on more than one or two topics over the course of a meeting. Uh, it just doesn't work that way given the, you know, the amount of time that you can spend in, in two hour meeting on a topic. Um, and then uh, the last point I, I think I want to highlight is the, the timing. There have been uh, some questions and discussion about the, the nine month extension from six months. This is one that having now personally been on a couple councils and, you know, I'd, I'd be keen to hear Blichter and Caveman's feedback. Six months, if it was, let's say, truly a, a full six month is about right. Um, the, the challenge with the process is as a new council member coming in, um, even, you know, even if there's carryover from epoch to epoch, you've got an entirely new group that has formed uh, the first two to four weeks are really getting getting you know, a handle on the key topics that are running, uh, figuring out where, where each person is going to be bringing the most value in a council so that you can work together. Uh, and then as everyone here knows, the, the last month basically, you know, you've, you've got the elections for the next epoch that are going. I wouldn't say that you're necessarily like out so busy campaigning in this role, um, but you do want to be very cautious as a council member not to make you know a decision that's going to handicap the next council coming in with a topic that might be uh, you know better suited for for the incoming group uh, as that's being decided. And so um, you end up with really closer to four months, maybe four and a half months of active work. Uh, and so having a, a longer epoch allows you to still recognize that you're going to have some you know, some give on the front and back end, um, but this should give us m more like seven and a half months of active involvement from from a council, which if you do the math, that's almost twice as effective in, in one and a half uh, amount, you know, amount of the time. Uh, and so overall, I think the nine months is, is a very good fit. Um, it was, pre it was I want to say, pretty unanimous in terms of the feedback uh, from, from most of the other council members that I spoke to that a single council uh, epoch goes very quickly if, if you're in that role. I will say, you know, then the question It even went really quickly from an outsider's perspective. Six months is nothing and it's just simple math at the end. If you have to do all this onboarding and getting used to the position with new newcomers, it's the, the longer, it's going to be a less of a percentage of the new epoch, the longer the epoch is. So it's, it's simple math, I guess. Comes, well, why not go to 12 months? We also do know that, that life happens. And uh, in my experience with uh, not just Alluvium, but other councils that I've worked on and observed, over the course of a typical year, uh, you'll often have you know one or two people in a council this size that are getting ready to you know to maybe change either jobs in their personal life or their their you know individual situation has shifted, um, and this reduces the chance that you're going to have people that uh, basically towards the tail end of the epoch have drifted away from active involvement. Right for for nine months, it's a lot easier to keep people engaged than for twelve. Um, if someone does need to step down, obviously we have process for for that. We have still the vote of no confidence structure in place. Um, if it's something that's identified within the councils or within the community. Um, so I still think we have appropriate controls there, um, but, but nine months in, in my view just makes a ton of sense 
uh, having gone through the process. Um, I don't think it's too, you know, too long that uh, you know, people feel like they're in for life. So, so that's really where the balance landed uh, in terms of the, the extension for the time window. And then, uh, you know, the, we didn't really have many questions on the structures. I think they're fairly straightforward for the specific committees. Um, obviously, we took uh, basically the three uh, second level sub councils uh, that we have in the current structure. And uh, we, we added now an operation, uh, one that, that takes uh, some of the work that the risk management committee uh, was intended to, to cover, uh, and then also add some, some finance pieces in here. I'm very confident we'll have some, some really amazing uh, individuals a note, I really underestimated how hard it's going to be to listen to an IMC meeting plus try to, to do good in the arena. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a really good, it's a really good tunnel, eh? Crazy. Um, <laughs> the speaking skills of Annie is incredible. Those that are able to join us in, in that space as well. Uh, and, and really at the end, it's, it's about making sure that we have the right people to advise the councils, uh, what, you know, whatever walks they're coming from. And so um, at the end of the day, uh, there's still going to be other pieces that uh, we know, you know as, a, as a council member of this epoch, uh, there are several um, uh, uh, individual IIPs and ICCPs that have either been passed or that are even in discussions now uh, around, you know, like the, the, the GIP process and some others that we're going to have to make some further adjustments to fit those into this structure. This was one of the the reasons why we had some some consideration about introducing this and the timing. It's a you know, it's a fairly quick cycle time to get something like this in place. That said, we we all felt that it made more sense to go ahead and do it now. Um, take the take the step feeling like this is the right thing to do on behalf of the DAO, even if it might be a little bit quicker than um, if some of us are comfortable with. Uh, and we can absolutely work through some of those details for how those processes need to be tweaked uh, when you no longer have the, the sub-councils that would have been in place for those topics. So those are, um, those are some of the key points around you know, sort of why GovV3, why individual items are there that I've seen questions about in the chat and in discussions. Uh, topics that we've had in the councils. Um, I see a few of the other council members that are here in the audience, um, and which I really appreciate. Please feel free to, to chime in. I saw Ricky made a comment in the chat. Um, I think Scrub is out here too. So yeah, add, add your own take on topics as well uh, where you see fit. And, and I'm going to turn it over to Caveman to talk a little bit now about where we see things going uh, over the next bit. What's, what's coming up next as far as uh, GovV3? Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Annie. Uh, and, and just to address your, your point on epoch length, uh, I definitely feel that it was quick. Uh, it was fast moving. And, and for the first couple of weeks, I, I definitely feel like we weren't in a position to really do much uh, to, to contribute in a meaningful way. And I wanted to. And so I think extending that to nine months is, is significant. Blicker, if you want to mention that real quick, and then I'll, I'll wrap up if what your thoughts are on epoch length. Yeah, onboarding is... Um... It's extremely important. Uh, some of the topics that council covers uh, needs needs a lot of context to be able to make good decisions. And the reality is that um, as we keep evolving, as we uh, pursue things like regulatory clarity, that onboarding process is it's not going to get shorter. It's only going to get longer. And the less the the lower percentage of an epoch we can have spent um, onboarding, the more effective council is going to be. So. Um, yeah. Well, in and, the past, I felt it was a bit of a risk point to have uh, these epochs moved to a longer structure, knowing what some of the activities we're engaging in are now, and how long it can take to to become comfortable with them, um, much less make make good decisions on behalf of the DAO uh, on those topics. It absolutely makes sense to have uh, longer epochs. Yeah, and, and as the IMC member that was new this epoch, like sorting through the channel, the, the legal channel, just scrolling back months and months of y'all debating and discussing all the documentation, uh, it takes a minute to get sped up there. So uh, I definitely think that'll be a positive 
motion for this governance. Um, but we still have work to do. Uh, and so there's a couple topics that we think um, are, are still being worked on. One of those is implementing the rest of what was good from V2 in the V3 documentation. Uh, in this IIP, we kept it fairly bare bones just to get the main points across. Um, but there were still a lot of just the, the, the processes and everything that will be in there. As Annie's mentioned, uh, we need to make sure that we also just find the best way to incorporate gamer feedback. And that's just in general. We're still, we, we love, and, and this is the, the positive, the best thing about the DAO is having the community, having the DAO be able to provide feedback. And so we need to figure out the best way to do that. So uh, obviously we have Vetimor's GIP in the, in the motion. Um, that's really going to be helpful there. And we're going to figure out how to incorporate that. But uh, finding out that how to do that is huge. Uh, we need to figure out our process for how we're going to handle new game pitches. You know, Johnny has uh, alluded to one already, um, which to, to some who find that a little frustrating, we, we decided to, to hold that back in the game sub council. Um, but it, finding a good balance of when to, to present these and how to present them, how are we going to rate which game pitches are we going to move forward with, uh, a lot of different situations to go there. So uh, that we're hoping to have at least um, a solution proposed by the end of the epoch, this epoch, to then incorporate into V3. Then any outstanding proposals we still have, I think we've got Square Access Tournament proposal, which is coming through, um, which will be, um, you know, we got to make sure that works with the new structure as well. And uh, I, I think that's a lot of what we're doing, but I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, governance is still being updated and it will be an iterative process. It, it'll change as our game expands and, and as we find more efficient, effective ways to govern. This is a gaming engine that is just getting started. Like I want to remind everyone that this is a new concept but at the core, the DAO is supposed to give the customer or the gamers in our, in our industry a voice, which has in many other studios been ignored by the community. I'm optimistic that we're going to find a structure that promotes that healthy ecosystem where the games will come out far superior quality than what is in their traditional counterparts. And I, I can already see it, actually. I've been, I just finished Assassin's Creed Mirage, and I can say confidently that Overworld has many advantages, and that's a huge studio like U Ubisoft. So I cannot wait for this game to come out next year, uh, and I really think um, but we're going to make some, some big waves and so that's what I have to say um, for this and, and I think we're gonna open up nice caveman coming in with the hype <laughs> I'm tapping to questions unless you guys have anything else to say yeah that maybe the only point I would highlight uh, is is around uh, what what's next as far as Vara and so so again for those that didn't get a chance to review the the document in the news this this will be the other point that I would say, you know, whoever ends up in, in the IMC and the community councils and in the committee's next epoch uh, will, I'm, I'm almost certain, ha you know, be expected to wrestle with some some kinds of feedback from from Vara, uh, and, and we'll have to make some major decisions on behalf of the DAO in this point. So some of which, uh, you know, we, we aren't sure because honestly, Vara is not sure right now. You know, they're, they're a regulator that initially is, has been focused on DeFi regulation, recognizes as as an you know as a, a jurisdiction that GameFi is relevant. You know they they have reached out to uh, you know to us and to other projects to have discussions in a proactive way about how to manage the space. And it's also very different trying to steer in, in their defense a, a project like Illuvium versus you know an, an L, L1 or L2 blockchain, right? Or you know, or a, a structure like a, a centralized exchange or something like that. And so, uh, very different industries in gaming versus versus finance. Uh, we're obviously at the intersection of the two. And so, uh, as we get feedback from them, that will be a work in progress, uh, both in terms of us. You know, having dialogue with them as the regulator, uh, and also you know us taking their feedback and making adjustments into our structure uh, to become really that that best in class uh, governance organization uh, among the entire gaming industry in Web three. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say, um, just since it it doesn't look like we have uh, any questions currently, I just wanted to to mention that. Um, there we go. At least nobody in the town hall had questions either. Because, to be honest, I cannot put too much input in there. Like, everybody who is speaking is well, uh, way more informed than me. So why would I make any pointers? But there is some stuff that they maybe don't mention because it's just 44 minutes and you could probably talk two hours about it. So maybe I, I see something that they left out, but I'm just, just giving the disclaimer. <laughs>
it's not gonna be so transformative this this react video <laughs> it's it continues to be super important for people to provide their feedback on on topics uh, including governance i know there was a, a proposal earlier this epoch to disband the marketing sub council that did end up with about a 50 50 upvote downvote ratio but um that helped make it clear to us that there there were things the community felt weren't working um obviously we we uh shared that sentiment and um, being able to receive that feedback from the community is important. I know sometimes it can feel like, oh, well, this didn't get acted on right away. When when the community provides feedback, we we do look at it, we do consider it, and um, we will work to to uh, resolve any problems the community is having with with uh, the way things are working. So I uh, just want to say that I I appreciate it, even when uh, even when things sometimes can get a little bit hostile. It's uh it's it's super important. So. Um, most of the people here are already fairly involved in governance, but just wanted to to thank you for that and say please continue, please continue giving feedback. It's incredibly important how the DAO operates. Yeah, if uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hands. And thank you guys for being up here answering the questions. Excited to get this moving along. Excuse me if there's a, a train horn in the recording because a train decided to honk its horn the whole way past my house. Um, somebody's got a question. I can't see who the name is. Yeah. So, I, oh, it's it's Scoriox. So uh, yeah, you... I was sure that I didn't even realize the train horn. <laughs> now that he said it, I realized it, but I I just thought it was a sound in the background here. <laughs> it's probably because you were too busy heckling him about being late. No way but, we won uh, that. <laughs> no, in, in general, uh, yeah, good good question, Scoriox. So uh, for those that can't see it, any contingency plans uh, if the committee system fails, uh, and in particular, um, the concern of, of lack of interaction with them? Um, so it's it's a great question. Um, I think I think the fails, I would just say, is, is probably a little bit of a, of a relative sense, right? The, the, the main risk that I would see is it's not like the entire governance structure just doesn't work. It's that we're not really getting value out of the individuals. Yeah. So I, yeah, don't 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 take it the wrong way, Scoriax. I think I think the risk is you know they're they're not being helpful. It's too difficult for us to you know to get in touch with the individuals uh, in that framework. We're not able to to you know still attract the right people. Those those topics um, are points that that you know in the future the IMC next epoch is going to have to evaluate. I would say that at, at a minimum you know the the option exists and and this has already been been stated in terms of the the framework. Uh, if there's an individual or you know or a few individuals that are just not really uh, supporting at the level that we would expect to see, um, they can be they can be removed and then put in place for uh, you have to have someone else put in in their place as committee members. I I mentioned one point that I think may not be so clear as as a community member, but but even you know regardless of all of the you know the amazing contacts that I might personally have, uh, because. They're not in general under NDA, and in some cases, uh, these might be individuals that are building other projects. You know, they're they're building potential competitors to Alluvium. Uh, I'm not going to have those discussions with those individuals on my own, right? And so, um, what I would say is there are plenty of, of folks in Web3 in particular who are very uh, eager to share, you know, and, and and support other studios that are trying to build things the right way. Um, there's very much a uh, you know a shared benefits if the sector does well. And so I, I remain very confident that even if some individuals are not providing a lot of value, the IMC will recognize that and has the ability to then, you know, ask them to, to step down due to, to time commitments or uh, you're just an inability to, to really help meet the DAO's needs at that moment. Um, I would expect that the individuals that we're, we're looking to bring onto these these committees to recognize that. I mean, honestly, they're, they're serving, you know, on behalf of the DAO anyways, as there's not direct compensation to them uh, personally in, in this framework. Uh, and so as a result, you know, I think the committee structure itself uh, can stay very flexible. Um, and it's up to the IMC to make that evaluation as they're the ones that are going to figure out how how good quality feedback they're getting. The the second question, uh, why nine months and not 12 months for length? Yeah, so in, so I, uh, I did mention this one a little bit earlier. Uh, the the twelve month window, uh, just e even from my own personal experience, is is very challenging. Uh, in other other councils that I've seen, uh, typically at the the eight to nine month mark, you have folks that their situations have changed. They're not as involved in a project anymore. They have you know, personal life uh, life adjustments, and it, it's time for them to move on. Um, 
if you've got a nine month epoch, you know, it's, it's about the right amount of time. If you have a 12 month, then you're, you're often going to be searching for a replacement uh, by the end of that cycle. And so it's not impossible to do so, um, but, but I think 12 months is, it's pretty long uh, in Web3 terms, in terms of real life uh, people's you know, commitments and, and time frame. And so, you know, I do, I do from just observation, think that nine months has been proven to be a better, a better. I guess we can all agree on that, that six months feels kind of too short, nine months. Now that they presented it that way, it feels kind of like the perfect amount and 12 months um, might be too risky. And you, after nine months works good, you can still prolong it to 12 months, but shouldn't jump to 12 months right away, especially because they said they had some experience with in 12 months usually something will happen i mean in nine months too you know you just gotta find that sweet spot and it's impossible to, to know it for sure but um the safest and most effective way uh, seems to be nine months so. timing uh than than uh than six or than 12. Uh, but again the the community you can certainly make that give us that feedback and, and see what they think uh and what they've seen but but for me it's due to just empirical uh evaluation uh -huh. and, and just to tell you those <clears throat> question uh, I, I definitely agree um, that maybe a standard could be really beneficial for that that way there's some clarity there um, but it I think a lot of times it does come down to NDAs and, and her question was uh, just for the recording is I, I don't know if that's being shown is um, the notes for councils uh, sometimes seem to be lacking information uh, and sometimes it leaves more questions than understanding and so having uh, our, our council notes is us trying to be visible with what we can, uh, and unfortunately, some of that uh, we either needs to be confidential um, or is strictly under NDA. Uh, let me uh, bring up Sneaky Poke here for a question real quick, and then I think we got DJ slapping or a couple more. But here, let me bring up Sneaky Poke real quick. Hello? Yeah, you're a little bit quiet. Try to uh, speak up. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I have a question about. Mara, I know it's kind of early days for this question because of all the regulatory uncertainty, but what kind of considerations went into, I don't know, maybe a potential no turning back scenario by committing to Mara as a regulatory body? Because a part of me thinks that maybe Alluvium knows that it, it might not be able to meet what the SEC in the United States might bring forward in terms of regulation. And I'm curious. I'm curious what kind of contingency plans we have if the United States has a much more strict regulatory requirements that might make us ineligible to even have a U.S. market for this game. I can, yeah, I can so, start it. Or you go, ahead. No, go ahead, Kate, man. I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I keep forgetting that everybody is so freaking informed on this stuff. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> I keep treating Illuvium just as a game, but right now it's... Um, yeah, it's... It's way more than that. It will be just a game for me soon. But in the beta, with just everybody being an investor and just needing to know and maybe already knowing everything about um, this kind of stuff is really interesting. There's so many experts. I've never been in a community that had so many experts in so many different fields. That's, I guess, what I want to try to say. Um, so, and this is speaking purely on myself, I think. You know, VARA is a stepping stone, that this is us getting used to the regulatory system and the ecosystem showing that, hey, we are trying to be compliant uh, as much as we can. And then if the U.S. comes and they are more strict and they have other regulations, I feel that I would support uh, pushing any regulations to, to meet that, meet those standards, because... Um, in my opinion, I don't think we're going to reach that explosion that, that uh, a lot of us dream about unless we are meeting uh, regulatory compliance there. Um, so in my opinion, I would be pushing for that, and I think that we would uh, push for that in general. I'll, I'll let Annie speak then. Yeah, Sneaky, it's a, it's a fantastic question. Uh, the the main point that I would I'd, I'd add to what Caveman shared is we, um, as, a, as a DAO, uh, any any journal that has attempted to give some clarity to uh, what their approach is from a regulatory standpoint in this sector uh, was under consideration. And, and so uh, I say that going going all the way back to last epoch when uh, the, the, really the wheels got put in motion all, all the way back at like 
the, almost the start of, of two, you know, last epoch. So almost a year ago, um, we had discussions at that point in time, uh, back when there was there was only one council, uh, and and we worked very, you know, obviously the, the legal team at, at Alluvium has been fantastic here. We worked very hand in hand as the, the council and the team to look at what options existed. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you have a jurisdiction that is not providing any clarity, any type of guidance, uh, it makes it pretty pretty impossible to try and comply with with uh, regulatory approaches that are just not there. And so this is, in, in your example of the US, uh, in some other jurisdictions, you know, where, where we were in Australia before, um, it's a it's a very challenging environment because there's there's just no clarity that's being provided. In, in some cases, uh, it appears by design from the regulators. And so, you know, with that said, you, you as a project are either left to, you know, try and find your own way and, and you know, make something up to the best of your abilities without having guidance, uh, or find a jurisdiction that uh, that you can be structured under that is trying to actually give some clarity and that allows you to say, okay, here's you know, here's what we're building, here's how we believe it's beneficial uh, for the community, for gamers, uh, and then and then try and come in compliance into that framework, which is where we are today. And so, you know, in terms of final decisions, uh, no, nothing has been finalized now. We're still uh, honestly waiting for a lot of the feedback um, from Varo on the initial application. Uh, and so that that will proceed apace going uh, assuredly in the next epoch. It could even potentially go into the one after, uh, depending on timing and, and how, VAR, how quickly VARA gets the final structures in place. But that said, th those considerations around what does it mean for the DAO? You know, what what does it mean uh, in terms of our structures? How can we be compliance? That's the that's going to be the responsibility of the next IMC to evaluate, um, and you know, and to honestly use some of these uh, these ad advisors that are going to be in the committees that oftentimes will have a lot of experience, uh, be they you know leads of of game studios or DeFi projects. Uh, be the individuals that are attorneys uh, specialized in the sector, and this gives us the opportunity to really work with them to to get some other eyes on the process. And um, and I would say I've seen that uh, play out in my own personal experience uh, with with ETH Lizards. Is I've had chances to now interact with a, about a half dozen different attorneys in different projects. And each one of them has a different view based on the work that they've been able to do in the sector. Um, but when you can put it all together, it really helps you have a good picture of different jurisdictions and, and the approaches. And so that that should be the, the expectations of future councils as well, is to take that feedback from VARA and continue to just evaluate the, the regulatory landscape uh, as things evolve. And you know, does what the U.S. Uh, do matter? A hundred percent. We've got got a lot of community members that are in the U.S. and at the end of the day, uh, we have to find a, a jurisdiction that we can actually get some transparency for. I see Blickter unmuted. Do you want to say something? Um, no, I was just going to. I was just going to. Uh, I think Annie already explained it fairly well, but I'm trying to mention that this is very much so something that's um, still fluid. Crypto regulation is evolving on. You know the time frame of of uh, days or weeks, right? Especially when we're talking about um, the specifics with VARA. So, um, at a high level, if 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 this if um, becoming licensed with VARA doesn't end up being something that works out, the structures in GovV3 are designed in a way where um, they're most likely to be able to be compatible with with other regulators, if that makes sense. So it's it's not uh, it's not necessarily a structure that's specifically specifically catered to Vara. Um, it's something that I think reasonably would be able. <laughs> There's somebody, a, a little kid outside, screaming, scream singing, and I was not sure if if it's in the recording. Able to there for that. Um, engage with other regulators, uh, which may have emerging emerging policies, which we might be able to engage with in the future, but. But yeah, it remains to be seen. And, and just to add one more thing too, uh, in recent news, you got Gods Unchained. Uh, they just got delisted from Epic Games Store. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure if the exact reason came out, but I've heard rumors that it has to do with the ESRB rating uh, and them being, you know, uh, mentioned as a gambling um, company, gambling gaming. So that's something that we also have to consider in this. And I know that I think. Or at least I think I remember VAR being strictly against gambling. So uh, that's something that we're also having to take into consideration. Yeah, and I, I would also like to just quickly add too, I'm, I'm hoping that Alluvium considers 
potentially be willing to pay a fine as well. Because in my view, I think the SEC would probably say, well, we've already transgressed. We weren't central or decentralized enough when we started. You know, we had um, maybe some questionable tweets early on. Maybe, you know, we had a, a um, basically, a you know, tokens being sold and being allocated to the team early on. And the SEC really doesn't like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that when the game gets released and I'm hoping it makes a lot of money that potentially we're forward thinking about this and, and maybe save up some money for a fine if we want to keep selling to the US. But yeah, that, that's just my thoughts on it. All right. Well, thanks for coming up. Anybody else got their hands raised? No. Nope. There's a couple more questions in here. EJ Slappin, is there a vetting process for committee members? Will the council have to approve them? Yeah, so the committee members under GovV3 are appointed. So essentially the way things are going to work is there's going to be a, a nomination period for IMC and committee members. At the end of that nomination period, there's an election for the IMC. Uh, following that, there's uh, a period in which the IMC evaluates the nominations for committees and appoints appoints members to those committees. So yeah, part part of the uh, nomination process for committees uh, will be essentially people saying, you know, this is who I am. This is this is a bit about my background. This is why I'd be a good fit on this committee. Um, and then the IMC will appoint people to those committees. I don't think I saw any more questions in here. This is this is recorded for anybody that showed up late. Um, it won't take me long to upload it. I think it's going to be significantly shorter than some of our other ones. And then I'll I'll post that link in uh, the governance news section. But yeah, I don't see any other questions. Would you support having three monthly peer reviews instead of just two? I think that was a yes. uh, splendor. Yeah. The, the, the point of the peer reviews is to keep the community up to date on the performance of their elected council members. And the the way it was passed originally was that basically we had one at the halfway point and then one uh, as we were coming into elections, which frankly is probably the more important one in most cases, but um, still important for the community to have some visibility on how council uh, and and team feel uh, their peers are performing, so yeah, I wouldn't have any problem with with adjusting that. And that's sort of one of the things that I know Caveman mentioned that we need to do some work updating the GovV2 structure and some of the proposals that have passed this epoch to to align with GovV3. Uh, that's sort of the things that we're referring to there. Is there's a couple processes that we'll just need like minor updates, minor tweaks to to make the most amount of sense under the structure. And so. That's what that's what we'll be trying to do uh, prior to the end of the epoch. But before we did that, we wanted to uh, reach out to the community uh, via the proposal and just make sure that there was support for uh, the broad structure, so that we weren't going ahead and updating a bunch of documentation for for reason. If the community didn't want this, so um, yeah, that that absolutely is something that I would be uh, in favor of personally. Oh. We got JP showed up. He's here. I don't know if he has a question or if he wants to say something. Bring the man up. He uh, he came just uh, immediately following his wedding. I mean, he, oh yeah, God. congratulations. He took a month off. You know, Congrats. at least JP's here working it. Um, <laughs> no, good. Uh, welcome back, JP. Yeah. yeah, good to be back. Yeah, I just got back in town uh, from my wedding, uh, so I. Been a little bit unplugged, uh, obviously, but I just saw the tweet about the IMC Town Hall, so figured I'd hop in and see what's good with you guys. Um, I have been keeping up with messages on the side, but uh, yeah, just glad to be here. Happy to weigh in on anything um, if needed, but I'm sure uh, these three fine gentlemen have uh, been covering it. So, um, but yeah, hope everyone's doing well. Congratulations. I think we're done. No more questions, guys. Like That's I said, uh, we'll get it timing. uploaded as soon as possible. Anything you guys want to say before we go? PvP is coming soon. Can't wait. <laughs> For those that are uh, enjoying Alofi and Beyond, uh, keep your eyes out. I'm not going to drop any alpha, but um, 
sometime next Wednesday might might see some interesting happenings in that space. <laughs> All right. Wednesday All right, well, today. Thanks for coming, everyone. As soon as it gets uploaded, I'll put it on the Governance News channel for everyone to check out. So have a good day, night, wherever you are. You too, Rich. Thank you very much for that thanks, tunnel. Rich. Yep. Yep. That was amazing. Well, I'm informed and I'm all for it. <laughs>